dance hall. The hottest dance in all of Jamaica. All of them Rihanna and Beyonce videos, all they dance moves originated right here in the dance hall. Everything good, my mommy good. Could be better. We about to fix that though, right? All of the big body girl them, block it down. Ain't another place like this on the planet. Dangerous, but good people. Only really dance. Oh, are you too gangster? It's in Kingston. Sweat, tears, work fast and hard. You got that last money I sent you? I did. I might need to go in for another operation. What are the plan? $10 million dance clash. You're going to win that dance competition and play so many. Hey! These gangsters are serious about this dance hall. Your answer to me, you mm. answer to nobody. Your team, you're ready for this. All dance, all money, we was all star. One good thing about music, when it hits you, you feel no pain. Nick Cannon, everybody, keep clapping. What's good, y'all? Keep clapping because he wrote, directed, starred, <laughs> produced, danced, built the cameras. All of that, craft service. Craft services. Make an egg sandwiches every morning for everybody. <laughs> Absolutely. Seriously though, what 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 did you do in this? You you wrote, you directed, did you produce it as well? I produced, I financed it, I uh, starred in it, uh, you know, did some of the music production and stuff as well. So, you know This is the the third feature that you've directed, right? Yes, Can yes. You tell us the third that you've third feature that you wrote. You wrote your last two as well? Yes, yes, yes. So I mean well I mean I wrote two previous to this. It wasn't my last two. I mean the last feature film I, I was a part of was Chirac, I think yeah, yeah with uh, Spike Lee. Unbelievable so movie. Spike did that one. Uh but uh yeah I mean that's I'm a I'm a huge fan of like the Woody Allen method of being able to come up with a concept and be in an intimate environment write it, produce it, have your friends and, and, you know, counterparts and peers be a part of it. And, I mean, you know, what he does, his thing, like, he does, like, one a year and been doing that for, you know, decades. So uh, I've always looked up to, to his work and, and how he actually is, like, in-house with everything. So that's my dream to be able to do passion projects like this uh, as long as, as well as like everything else that I do but this is like really a labor of love and um, you know that's what we get to it so now the entire world gets to see it how long was the the whole process for you I want to get into the the details about the film and, and the beautiful work that you do in the film but just the whole process of creating it writing it and then getting it made getting it shot and then editing it how long was the whole process uh, the process actually interestingly enough from writing to shooting was like six months you know it was extremely quick from like my first time step and foot in the Kingston, Jamaica, being, you know, overwhelmed with creativity and passion to actually shooting six months later. Took about a month and a half to, you know, complete the entire, you know, uh, cinematography and everything uh, and production of the film. And then the long part kicks in is when you do post. And that's, you know, editing and putting the film together and getting the music right and the graphics and everything. So um, that that took probably the, the another year. So from that point on, and then it debuted at the Toronto Film Festival last year. And, and from there, we've just been riding. And we, you know, recently partnered with YouTube Red and, and now the entire world can see it. Yeah, it's up there today, right? Right? People yeah, you check it out it. today. Now, so you go to Kingston, Jamaica, and do you have an idea for a film before you got there? Or did you get there and say, wow, I want to make a film about this? Yeah, uh, interestingly enough, ironically, one of the stars of the film who's actually here uh, with us right now is Cresha Turner, was more like a muse for me for this project because she's a, uh, an artist uh, that's from, uh, has a Canadian Jamaican descent and I had never been in Jamaica and she was like yo we gonna go promote you know dance hall music you gotta go to a real dance hall and the first time in Jamaica first time stepping into a dance hall I was like 
whoa, like I had never seen anything like this. And you, I mean, you get an opportunity to see in this film to where it's a culture like no other. I mean, there's so much passion and electricity and you know we we know a little bit about it when we see Rihanna and Beyonce doing some of the moves that originated there you hear a, a Drake or a Beaver song or an Ed Sheeran song borrowing from the culture but to, like the, we get the cliff notes yeah version yeah, of yeah but culture, to really yeah. get in there with the the meat and potatoes or or as I say the rice and peas of it all <laughs> like to really see where it's all originated from and that that passion that that West Indian culture is, is amazing and and um, I, I was from that point, I was sold the, like I did not leave there without a screenplay uh, because I was like, no, I got to do this. I got to get this going. And I put it all together on that first trip to Jamaica. And like I said, six months later, we were in production. In the film, uh, I feel like the story, I don't want to use the word borrow, but I think you you go there and it feels like you're like, I want to tell a story here. Let's take like Dirty Dancing and a gangster movie yeah, and all yeah. these other kind of, these movies that we know about when it comes to sort of dance movies. Yeah. And- and just bring it here. One hundred percent. It was outstanding uh, because I did have quite a few influences. Uh, like I said, I've never seen anything like this. But we've seen the types of films. Like you say, we've seen Dirty Dancing, but there's no dirtier dancing than dance all dancing. Uh, and there's nothing wrong from taking yeah, from the best. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, Dirty Dancing, Saturday Night Fever was an inspiration for me. Uh, uh, City of Gods, you know what I mean, and and the, how they. I remember the first time I saw that film, and I had I never knew Brazil was like that. So I wanted to, you know, unveil uh, Jamaica in that same beauty and that same light. So like a crackling energy to City of God that yeah, you definitely bring yeah, to yeah, that film. rawness. Yeah. And and you know what's also there's films that were made in Jamaica that had similar elements that you know this generation may not be familiar with, like you know Jimmy Cliff's So Harder They Come and something like that's a true music film. And, you know, so I, those are a lot of my inspirations in putting this together. And, uh, you know, I, I think I think we did it justice. Absolutely. What was it like shooting in, in Kingston? It was intense shooting in Jamaica. I mean, I, I, a lot of people like when you think Jamaica, you, you see what you, you think, cool runnings. <laughs> and you think, you know, the beach and palm trees and like nah, it's, sandals. Yeah, yeah nah, <laughs> Kingston is real. But uh, it was a beautiful thing because the people there just embraced uh, me, the process, the entire production. And so it was quite helpful, even at, at, in, in the in the most dangerous and, and grimiest areas, it was all love, you know, and and uh, I think everyone had an outstanding time and, you know, the product speaks for itself. Now, when it came to dancing, Uh-oh. what was your <laughs> process like getting ready to be dancing on camera? How much of your own moves did you want to yeah, be able to do? Man, I was, I was definitely nervous about dancing, but the beauty of it all, I, I was so focused on the authenticity of this this story in this culture that even the way I told the story from the perspective of an American through the eyes of my characters, you know, fresh from Brooklyn, who wasn't a dancer, you know what I mean? So the fact that I can actually tap into those real sensibilities of through the film and through my character, we were both learning, you know, the, the culture. So, you know, the, the first dance scene in this film, I'm very awkward, <laughs> you know, and, uh, it's a, it's true. And as you, you, you embody the culture and you, you, uh, kind of dig deep into it, you see that process. And so, and, and the way I did it, I did in an authentic way. I didn't take, uh, dance classes or anything like that. We went to the dance hall. I hung with the real crew that you see in the, the movie and they taught me the dance moves. And and to be able to do that, like this is what these guys do each and every night and they live it. So I had to live it with them. Yeah, we definitely see that. It doesn't seem like, you know, as your character progresses, it's not like we see, uh, you know, a close-up of your face and then a wide shot that's clearly somebody else dancing, yeah, right. like some kind of stuntman. No, nah, we jumped right into it. And that was the thing, too. I also wanted to do what was real, you know. Uh, you know, these guys... It's interesting because the gangsters dance in Jamaica. You know, the tough guys, the rude boys, they're the ones that are on the dance floor. And, you know, here you think you go to a club and shoot, all the guys are standing on the wall, you know what I mean? Uh, guys really don't dance like that. Uh, so to see, you know, all this masculinity, but but still in, in such a flamboyant and, and fancy and artistic way, like they, they really move their bodies in ways that 
you wouldn't imagine and, and and you're not used to seeing you know tough guys move so to be able to do that and even show that on screen was pretty fun so what is the what is the process like for you uh when you're on set and you're starring in the film and you're directing it because lots of different directors who star in their own work have different types of process do you have you know a dp that you trust to tell you that everything has been covered or are you going back and looking at the monitor all the time uh you know what Definitely on an independent, you don't have time to go back and look at the monitor. So you have to kind of trust your DP, trust your crew. Uh, luckily enough, it, a lot of preparation goes into it, rehearsal. So, you know, and then you have, again, like you said, make sure your, your, your camera team and your cinematographer are capturing it from all angles. And, you know, to me, a lot of directing happens in post. Um the the process of directing for me in production is just it's like a it's like a puzzle so it's all about getting the pieces as long as you get the pieces you put the entire puzzle together in post so i was just concerned like every time i take it like we got it we got it we got it all right moving on you know uh and then you that's also in pre-production you have to make sure that everybody's on so your job as a director is kind of what you're saying is in pre and post to make sure everybody's on the same page going into post and then you can put everything together 100 percent, especially because i know when i'm on screen and in front of the camera i can't be thinking about where the camera is obviously i have to be so in character so long as the pre uh production is handled and post i know i'll get to it i get to focus on being my character it's uh, i think spike lee used to say the same thing that his least favorite part of making movies was production yeah. and that it was a hell yeah that's the hardest part and then he would say post is, is pure heaven he yeah, just gets to sit with his movie yeah and you just get to sit there and build and it's the longest process as well so you you know uh it's always say there's always three different movies there's the script there's uh actual production and shooting it and then what the movie becomes in post so uh I, your, how did your film change throughout all three you know it was early on it, one it was three hours long uh, initially went from the script stage but it was more i didn't have all the authenticity in the in the script and when we shot it you know the phenomenal cast and and the actual environment gave it a whole different energy it just uh kind of blew this breath of life into to it that i i couldn't do because you know i'm not of the culture i'm 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 not jamaican so i allowed that to just happen and then once we got into post trimmed it down uh focused on it was interesting because the it was a very linear narrative uh from the script stage and then once I got there, the world was so big that I was like, I need to tell more. And then that's when I came up with the idea to kind of split this docu style and have Beanie Man, who is the true king of the dance hall, narrate the story and actually give the history of the culture and the talk. And you see these uh, inserts throughout the film of explaining what dance hall is, explain, explaining what Jamaica and, and reggae and all of that means to their culture. And then it all comes together at the end. So that that actually was something that happened while I was in Jamaica and then really came to life in post. How do, uh, I don't want to say how do people in Jamaica, because obviously it's not monolithic and everybody has different feelings. <laughs> right. But when you're exploring dance hall and you're exploring this music and you talk about people in the States sort of uh, cribbing from dance hall and putting it in their own music and cribbing the dancing. How do people uh, generally feel about that in Jamaica? Like, feel about that versus what you're doing, which is really trying to dive in and explore and tell the story. I think they have really embraced and um, are truly proud of what we've done with King of the Dance Hall because, unlike some of the other things that we've seen uh, previously, as you say, that have, have been cribbing from the, the culture. They just don't get an opportunity to tell the story. I don't think, uh, you know, I, I remember there was even like, you know, Sean Paul has some words for Drake and all that stuff. And I don't, I, I think Drake is a fan of the culture and loves the culture. But, you know, he, through his music, he doesn't have the opportunity to tell you the entire history of dance hall. He's just saying, as a fan, I like this. Uh, and he gives, he puts his spin on it. But I think to be able to shed light on, you know, some of the greats, I mean, everyone is featured in this film from from uh, Beanie Man, Sean Paul, Ninja Man, Kamani Marley, all these people are a part of this project. So they, we haven't seen that before. So I, I think there's a there's a sense of pride in what we've created here. And then hopefully that spills over into, you know, the new artists who do want to borrow from the culture. So at least they know some history. Yeah. 
Uh, now I have to ask, uh, we've said that you're kind of a renaissance man on this movie in terms of all the roles that you play, but even when you're making this movie, you're also doing lots of other stuff in your career, <laughs> yeah. right? I mean, just in January, I think you debuted a new stand-up special yeah. on Showtime, which yeah. is wild. Most people just take years to make a stand-up special, not a stand-up special, and then a movie. And then, <laughs> right. you know, you host A couple shows other well. shows that I produce, yeah. running Team Nick, you know, my music itself, and my record label, all of that stuff. Uh, but I think you kind hit it on the head. I mean, Renaissance Man, I mean, it's such a big title, but that's what I aspire to be. Um, and when you think of some of the great entertainers that have come before us, they did it all too. And when I speak of everyone from Sammy Davis Jr. to Bob Hope to Frank Sinatra to, you know, you had to be able to do it all. You had to be able to play four or five instruments and be a showman and be a producer and uh carry yourself with such charisma that you can host a television show if need be. Uh, it, it's all entertainment. I feel, I feel like I get to wake up each morning and just create and be an entertainer. So I, also, I see it as one big job. Um, Did you enjoy hosting uh, television when you hosted the big, the sort of the big network know, show? I, I, it was a job and I love jobs. <laughs> we all love jobs. Uh, Probably a good job. It was a great <laughs> job. With, uh, but I love being an artist more. And when I can dive into opportunities like this or even in like I live in the studio and if I'm not in the studio, I'm hanging out in the front of a comedy club with a bunch of comics, you know, it's like that place where you could just create and live in that. It's so therapeutic. And, you know, especially when you have a crazy life like mine, to be able to find solace in art is is really outstanding. So that's why I want to do a passion project a year. That's why, you know, I continue to, you know, produce artists and and uh, put out my own music as a musician and stuff. So uh, I, I think I'll always do that because that's, that's where my passion truly lies. That was the dream as a kid, you know, sitting in your room, or, you know, staring into the mirror. It, it wasn't about just, you know, having a job. It was more about being the best artist you could possibly be. Did you feel uh, restricted by, by, by the job to a degree? Uh, what, what I say restrict, never restricted, never restricted in a sense of being myself. You know, I, uh, I think a lot of times people have gotten that messaging misconstrued where I was thinking that I was like, oh, I couldn't be me. I was definitely 100% myself on AGT. Uh, I think a lot of the frustration for me probably came when, uh, everyone understanding that there are many sides to us. We all have different layers and sometimes they see this side and they don't want to see another side or they don't want you to express yourself in a way that you would typically express yourself. But obviously I know how to be professional in every environment, but as sometimes I think as artists, we need to embrace each other and embrace all ideas. And sometimes that, that hierarchy in the bureaucracy of, of, an, of a network or something like that, they, they can kind of, they, they can at least attempt to try to control you. And, you know, I feel like I, I'm my own boss. I can't be controlled and I can't be moved as an artist. I'm, I'm going to stand firm in what I believe. Do you ever feel like some of the some of the projects that you produce or even, you know, AGT when you hosted that have an effect on the passion projects that you do? Like King of the Dance Hall is nothing like anything you've done before. I would, I would say if it's any if it's like anything you've done, it's like Chirac or yeah, something, yeah, you know, yeah. and that's a film that you're you're an actor in. But do you feel like, you know, having hosted a family program, having produced family programs and some of the stuff on MTV affects the perception it definitely does, but I welcome the challenge. You know, uh, I don't right. I don't look at it, or even with the scope of my career, I don't look at, oh, what am I going to do in 2017? Uh, I, again, I have a bird's eye view from like, oh, what did my entire career embody? And when you look at some of the greats, I, I'll keep using Bob Hope as an example. I mean, the man did everything from you know, host the Oscars to star in films, to be a comedian, to go to create the USO tour, like all of these things, radio, he, he did it all. Uh, but if you kind of compartmentalize his career, you know, based off of uh, a, a time schedule, you'd be like one year he was a great host, one year he's a great actor, one year he's a great comedian. So if hopefully, you know, at the end of the day, when it's all said and done, they can say, wow, over the course of, you know, a half a century, Nick Cannon did all of these things. And, you know, I'm, I'm two decades in and I feel like I'm just getting started.
Absolutely. Uh, I mentioned we mentioned Chirac a couple of times. Yeah. I'm gonna ask you, what was it like working on that film? Because I, I mean, I love that film. I think it's one of the most underrepresented, underrated Spike Lee movies. Yeah, yeah. I thought that movie was that absolute shit. If you didn't like it, you don't like movies. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, but what was it like doing that? I mean, it's a crazy movie. Yeah, I am in Pantameter. Crazy. You're working with Spike. It's like yeah. one of the biggest budgets I think he's gotten for an independent project in yeah, a while. Yeah, man. It Beautiful. was outstanding. I love it. And it was, again, a labor of love on his part. And he actually, the first thing he ever said to me is like, yo, I want to change lives. Not even change. He said, I want to save lives in the south side of Chicago. And I said, I'm in. And then when he told me his creative approach and how he wanted to take Lysistrata, which, you know, was this 2,000-year-old Greek play, <laughs> and, and put it in uh, Inglewood in Chicago, I was like, yo, that's brave. And, and satire, yeah, too, which was so smart. It was, man, and, and he has his reasons and his passions, and when you hear him speak, it makes sense. It goes over some people's heads, but when you see that film, it's beautiful filmmaking. And, I mean, even when you think about the cast from Samuel L. Jackson, Dave Chappelle, Wesley Snipes, Angela Bassett. I mean, like, to to be in a film with all those people directed by Spike Lee was a dream come true for me. So I, I would do it again and again. Uh, and Did you learn anything from him that helped you? Man, I learned everything. It's funny because I was shooting, um, I, I was... It was kind of on both ends, but after Chirac finished, I kind of immediately went into a lot more work on King of the Dance Hall, and he gave me so much advice, and he kept, even during the process when he cut his film, which he cut his film way faster than I cut mine, <laughs> and he was like, yo, I want to come in to edit, I want to see it. I was like, no, no you're Spike Lee. <laughs> you can never see this unfinished, and... um. But he was a big brother to me too, through the entire process, and I learned so much. I learned so much about conviction, dedication, and integrity. Um, just to watch him make a film, watch him make decisions and stick to it. And do, he doesn't care about what other people have to say when it comes to his art. He has to get it out during pre-production, production, and even promoting the film. Uh, he, he stood firm in it, and he didn't back down from anyone. And a lot of people came at him for that film, and he's stood his ground 10 toes down and I, it was really admirable i did an interview with him where people came at him at the in the interview the yeah that it was amazing yeah, yeah he, he held he his took, own right oh, he totally held his own yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was spike lee you don't want to argue with that dude <laughs> you ever been to a nick game you know how it go <laughs> how was it uh as an actor being directed by him he's he's very demanding of his actors from what i hear He's so demanding, but I think it's it's interesting. You either get on Spike's uh, good side or bad side, and luckily I was on the good side. Like I've heard, I, I've I've seen him kind of like if you you don't give him what he he, he wants, he gonna tell you. Like he gonna make sure. And uh, I remember one scene, uh, one of the the final scenes uh, where you know everyone comes together and they're all dressed in white, and I have this really powerful scene where I have to pretty much recite. Uh, a sonnet or a, a long just monologue of poetry directly to camera and I have to start off tough you know in in almost in this this place of just like no emotion and then at the end of the poem and the end of the you know the the long walk I had to be in full tears and so that took a lot, you know what I mean, to do that over and over again because Spike wanted to get it in one shot. He didn't want to cut. So I had to kind of like get in this space, but it's 250 people around. So Spike, being the director that he is, I mean, because everybody's kind of talking, doing their thing, you're on set. He stepped up and spoke to everyone. And when I say spoke, I mean yelled his ass off <laughs> and said, yo, this man is working over here and he he has to do something that is damn near impossible. So I need everybody to be just as focused as he is and like just silenced everyone. And and it was, you know, it was just pure respect. And I was like, that's a director. You know what I mean? Like that's someone who knows what they want, knows what is up. Here. I didn't ask him for this or any of that. It was just he knew what he had to get. And I mean, everybody just kind of just knew where we were. And that was a time where everyone was on set. It was the entire cast. So from Jennifer Hudson, Angela Bassett, like everybody Everybody was there in that moment just he just comforted me but then at the same time set the tone for his film and that's when I was like yo you you working with a, a, a true professional and, and an expert right there so I, I I have nothing but good things to say about Spike Lee. I have to ask how did you prepare to be able to do that to do that scene as an actor? Yeah man I mean one I like had in your trailer? Yeah right? nah it wasn't even that one 
it was a, it was pretty intense because also out of those 250 people were real life mothers and family members of slain victims of Chicago, and they were holding signs of their loved ones that they had lost. So that in itself was just intense. That, Do not screw this. Yeah, up. yeah, but but even the idea, like emotions are on high, you know, uh, in in a real way. Like these weren't actors; these were people who were on set representing their loved ones, and. And then from that, man, I really lived similar to what I did in King of the Dance Hall. And it, similar, going back to my first film, Drumline, I think one of the things that I do as an actor, I need to find the authenticity. And once I find it, I stay there. Drumline, I lived with the with my my uh, as we called it the Senate back then. We the my Drumline, all the snare players. We stayed together, you know, and I never deviated. I didn't go to a trailer or nothing. I stayed in the in the dorms with them, you know, learning all of those cadences. So um, in in this film, you know, it was Kingston, Jamaica. We lived it, but my dance crew were my friends. You know what I mean? We would go to the dance hall together. We would hang out together. We would smoke uh, the the. <laughs> The the herbal uh, <laughs> plant of the land, uh, uh, but and then even in like Chirac, it, which was dangerous at times. We we were on the south side of Chicago with the with the with the guys, you know, as they call it. Like we were there with the gang members, and you know, with the guys who had who were currently in the life. Some of the guys that were trying to make it out, and you know, community leaders. But I was there every aspect, and that's one thing that no one can ever say, whether it's this film, whether it's Shy Right, they can never say, oh, you went and did the Hollywood thing. Like, I can't be a part of those type of things. I have to find the authenticity just to be able to be that performer, that performer, that artist to, to, to convey something real. But then at the same time, I never like to bastardize or, or be superficial with someone's true story. And that's what we had the opportunity to do here. Were you able to keep the herbal plant of the land off uh, <laughs> off the actual set while you were trying to work? I don't I don't know if you ever been in Jamaica. It's kind of hard to keep the uh, <laughs> herbal plant of the land away. Uh, did, you part did you partake at all while sh while shooting? Could I you, had to. You really? Yeah, I had I, to. This is not me sitting in judgment. This is me I, wondering how you work. Well, that, you know what? It was always after work. Oh, after work. But I mean, I don't know if you're allowed to say this, but like, if it was weed in the scene, that was not. Play, play weed. That was, that was not the the tobacco wrapped up. That was the real stuff. Uh, I think I had to mention it's harder to find play weed. Than yeah, just, yeah, just, yeah. Weed. just have yeah. the real stuff there. So, uh, nah, we 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 were. And I'm gonna be honest, like when you come from places like California and you know where they have all these hybrids and laboratories like it's just of the land in Jamaica it's just the real stuff so you don't have to worry about being too chemically high it's just a nice even Jamaican chill high so you can still function on that you're not cowering in a corner going am I making something good I don't know what I'm <laughs> yeah. doing anymore with myself exactly uh, let's get some questions from the audience right here Hey, Nick, how are you? I'm well, how are you? I'm good. My question is, because you talk about the culture being so prevalent in this film, did you take away anything of the culture of the film, even of the music, while working there? 100%. I mean, I think I grew as, a, as an individual and as a man uh, through this process of, from, you know, writing the script, but e even tapping into the culture of what it means to love one's culture, to love one's heritage, because... I never seen uh, a, a group of people or a community embrace who they are so much. Like, I mean, if any, if there's anybody uh, <laughs> from the islands or any that here today, you know, like especially like in New York, if you if you represent in Jamaica or any West Indian culture, they let you know from the jump, and that was so powerful. That made me want to dive in and 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 even understand who I was. Uh, and then, like you said, with the music, I mean, I I had always been a fan of it. But I was never really a student of it until this film, and I learned so much about where the music originated. And obviously, the the greats like Jimmy Cliff and Bob Marley, and you know uh, how it's carried on today, and and the fact that it really is a, a true export of the country. I mean, when you think how global uh, Caribbean music and culture from you know 
Bob Marley is a, a global icon. I, if there's aliens, they've heard a Bob Marley song. You know what I mean? Just because he means... They have dorm rooms, they have posters. Yeah, Bob <laughs> exactly, and T-shirts. Um, but that's, it's so important. So to be a part of that, I feel like I, I definitely came away with it. And I, I pray, I hope that because of this film, I can now say that you know I will forever be embedded in the culture because that's what we set out to do. Next question. Hey, Ricky. Hi, Nick. Hey, how you doing? I want to ask you the moment that you actually caught on to the fact that you really knew that you were in that moment with, like, one with the dance hall. <laughs> how did that feel, and what kind of energy did you give you? Because I, I know that's, like, really a passionate dance. Yeah. What did that feel like the moment you knew, like... I yeah, know. yeah, exactly. It was, you know what it was? It was that moment in the dance hall where the entire dance hall turns and starts cheering me on. And it's like, first it's like, oh, are they making fun of me? I'm like, oh, no, no, they like me. I'm doing well. <laughs> like, and uh, it really got to a place where they were like, we accept you and, you, and you're living it. You're not, you're not perpetrating. And that energy, I just felt at one with the, with the people and, and everybody's smiling and everybody's dancing. And, and I was like, that's what I want to embody in, in the film because he, my character kind of s- starts off as this lone ranger type of guy who never really experienced love, kind of been on his own trail. But then through this process, he finds love, you know, in a woman, but at the same time in a culture and a people. And he feels like he's a part of something for the first time. And I felt that feeling when actually getting that moment, like, oh, man, this is I got to make sure I, I display this on screen as well. I think we have time for a couple more questions right here. Hi. Hello. Um, I was just curious, since you had to dance a lot in this movie, uh, did you have any like dance moves that were really difficult to learn at first? Oh, all of the dance moves are difficult to learn. Because you know what and we talk about it in the film? It's a different beat. It's a different rhythm. It's the upbeat. Yeah, so like if you're a dancer and you're used to like a regular eight count or something, it's like one, two, three. Like they, it, they, it doesn't bop like that. It's a different rhythm. So like to catch it isn't the easiest thing. You have to naturally have it in you. And it takes a minute to kind of catch that wave. So uh, and luckily, again, I, I had some on the job training with, you know, everyone where I spoke of from Cresha Turner to, you know, Kimberly who plays Maya to Jay Blaze who's the choreographer who was just like, yo, we just gonna find what you do well and perfect that. And that's really how we built the entire choreography for me. And then we just let all the other dancers just go buck wild and do their thing. You know, we didn't even talk about some of the people that you have in the cast. You've mentioned a few, but uh, we didn't talk about Busta. How did you get Busta in the film? Man, Busta Rhymes, he deserves an award for this performance. I don't know if you guys... He deserves an award for just being Busta. Being Busta <laughs> Rhymes, one of the greatest hip-hop performers ever. Uh, but it, he's always been like a big brother to me in the game. I mean, we worked on music before in the past, and he's always looked out for me. And when I was writing the script... I. I had no one else in mind because when I wrote the character, I needed this character to kind of be that translator. He, you know, the the character of All Star Toaster is my cousin and kind of like my counterpart throughout the entire film. So he's the guy that understands American culture. Uh, but and but still speaks with the heavy patois accent because he's of the Jamaican culture. And I was like, there's no one else that I know that can pull that off besides Buster Rhymes because we've all heard his dance hall songs. We've all heard him go into his patois, but we also know and love him for the mainstream artist that he is. So he embodied that in such a way and then brought such another layer of just realness and authenticity. When he's in pain, you see that pain. When you see his, that elation, you see... It, he glows, you know, and uh, I feel like you're going to see so many more acting roles from Buster Rhymes. You know, I mean, he's done some great work even before this. But from here on, I know he's just going to continue to take over the game of acting. I hope so. I yeah. think we have time for one more question. Right. Hi, Nick. What's going um, on, man? So since you since you directed, produced, wrote, and dan- uh, danced in this movie, and this is your third time at bat with directing... Does it get easier over time, or what's the trickiest part of Ooh, doing all this I stuff? I definitely don't think it gets easier, especially because my passion projects are usually really hard. You know what I mean? Like, even my next film is going to be a street basketball movie, and I can't play a lick of basketball. <laughs> uh, so uh, it's, it's, 
but that's the beauty of being an artist and an actor, man. You get to jump into these roles and to these people that you you they're foreign to you and you learn these skill sets and you train. And so I'm up for that challenge. I love it. It's it's hard every time, but uh that's that's what being a great artist is all about. Absolutely. Thanks the the, the the film King of the Dance Hall is on YouTube Red right now, right? People yeah, can check it out. Yeah, you go check it out. It's 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 available for the for everyone to see. Nick Cannon, everybody, congratulations, Thank Nick. You.